So I'm here a province over in Alberta at Boss Farms with uh, Patrick and this looks eerily similar to something I built and actually he improved on a couple things so I figured I'd better come and share this with everybody and we're going to take you through his project. So So Patrick, this uh, this looks eerily similar to to my design that I put out on YouTube, and I'm happy to see it somewhat uh, reproduced. But you actually made some really cool changes and additions, including sand battery underneath the concrete, the solar thermal heaters. I've yet to even hook mine up, but the design is working very well from you. Um, I don't know. Just give me a brief explanation on kind of your build or why you wanted to build it and and how you like the design I don't know just uh, we'll start, I had yeah. researched the greenhouses for a couple of years and then when I saw your video originally then I right away said that's one that will work in our thing so and it was proven that it would work so I yeah. got a building quote on it and then once I priced it all out it turned out to be cheaper than anybody else and it was a good concept that works well and so then I took what I knew of the way I've built buildings in the past yeah. and modified your concepts because we think a lot the same and came up with what I, I think works for me. Like yeah. I'm in a beautiful microclimate here with all the trees around, spruce trees and everything else. Yeah. And then I don't deal with a north wind because I have all the trees. Yeah. And so I can sit here and the snow just settles in and keeps everything well insulated around. I don't have to worry about frost here. Yeah. Yeah, you're in a great little microclimate, protected from the north, open on the south, your outside gardens to the south, kind of a microclimate area, and trees far enough away, it doesn't block too much of the sun out, but what, uh, what I just popped in my head, I didn't meet you or you didn't reach out until you essentially, I forget if you emailed me, sent me a picture, it's like, that looks like my greenhouse, but no, I, I don't have green siding, and, and you, you reached out after you built it. And that's how I did mine too. I, you know, you just look and then you build. So, so that was nice to see you, you contacted me. Hey, look what I built and, and yeah, showed me I, after. Yeah. Yeah. I've built enough buildings in the past that once you put your information with that, I it was enough for me to run with it yeah. and get yeah. things rolling to build this. And, yeah. and it, it was during a time when supply chains were not very good. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of to get it all here and get it done. It took me four months or something yeah. to build it. I started in, as soon as the frost came out of the ground, I pushed open the old dead trees that were here and then started building. That was the end of April. And then by August, they already were planting a banana tree in here. But by November, I had the thermal heating units working and starting to go. It was yeah. a little late because I can start charging the sand battery in about September right. already to get that mass built in. Yeah. You start chasing your tail with the sand battery when you hit mid November, you're not getting enough hours of sunlight. Yeah. Right. And to start mine that late and that was supply chain issues. We couldn't get the stuff here that we wanted to get here. Yeah. And then so that first winter was a little bit trickier to get through, but like this winter has been fantastic. I've used when it was minus forty one that one week I used, I think, a hundred dollars worth of diesel for a heater. Yeah. The and whole that, winter. That's the that, whole. That's my whole cost so far yeah. of heat. And I use firewood to buffer on some really cold nights and stuff. But the sand battery maintains every morning when I come in. It'll be about plus twelve in the greenhouse. Yeah. And then in the day, like when it was minus forty-one, there, my wife and daughters were playing board games in there because the school was canceled. Yeah. And then they, they were sitting in there, it was plus 35. I was trying to open up windows, but I came in from minus 35 outside, like yeah. 70 degree temperature differential, and it was just fun. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, when you talk the, the sand battery, what, he, what Patrick did that's super smart, and I wish I did, like w with what I know now and talking with him, but it, he, so the in floor heat pipes, your concrete area and growing area is kind of the same as mine, but the in floor heat pipes you didn't put in the concrete. So what it is, you dug down, how far How far was I it? Down two feet below grade. Okay. And then I put my styrofoam insulation down because ground temperature here in the winter time, eight feet down is six degrees Celsius. Yeah. And I don't want that to quench my sand battery. Right. So then I have my 
styrofoam insulation, then I did six inches of sand, packed sand, and put my PEX floor heating lines there. And then I did another, say, 14 inches of packed sand, and then my concrete. So all that two feet of there is thermal mass yeah. to release heat through the night yeah. and maintains the temperature in the greenhouse. Yeah. You're right, like everybody talks about the, uh, they call it the climate battery where they take air tubes, so they run it from the hot part of the greenhouse, air tubes underground, and bring it up, and some of the claims that we've heard are that you charge it up all summer and it withdraws all winter. Well, our ground is way colder than, say, places like Nebraska. Everybody talks about that um, uh, oranges in the snow fellow that built that style. Our ground is a lot cooler, so for, yeah, for you to do a sand battery and actually insulate under the sand so the earth doesn't suck your heat away makes a whole lot of sense. I wish I did that. What I did in mine was in-floor heat in the concrete, just on gravel, no insulation, so I figured if I can keep applying heat, the earth will kind of, it's like a passive geothermal, I figured. It will take it. Yeah. But it's not as efficient as having the insulation underneath it. That's right, yeah, because you really just stop the earth from taking it and have whatever that 14 inches of, yeah. of thermal know mass. I don't use of storage that would be, but I know that it works. Yeah, right, right, for that's sure. That's what it is. And, and then the water heating from the solar thermal tubes, right. well, it's glycol going through that part, but then water going through the pipes in the floor. Yeah. Um, it's a way better heat transfer device than air to say rocks through weeping tile. That's yeah. not a very good heat transfer device at all. Yeah, I, I like I like water glycol too. You can move it. It's pumps, right? Yeah. The the air doesn't give it the enough heat and transfer. It's, it's so efficient. What the actual water yeah. will store in BTUs. Right. Right. And and transfer through the PEX floor heating. That's why we do it in our houses and different things. Yeah. Right? Exactly. It works. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, let's go have a look inside, shall we? Yeah. So. Right on. Okay. So we're inside, uh, and it looks eerily similar, the, the sidewalk, the raised bed, I think we're good opening windows, kind of same thing I did. In-ground growing next to the concrete, um, you have some li uh, lighting and some hydroponic stuff, fish tanks at the back, things. Bananas even r uh, close to this similar spot, yeah. and you are going to get fruit right away based on the looks of mine, so get ready for that. I but. But uh, where do we start? What are the uh, dimensions of the greenhouse? It's, it's identical to yours. It is, it's, <laughs> it is yeah, 64 feet long. Okay. It ends up being 32 feet to the post here, and then it's 11 feet out based on the 45 degree angle. Yeah. Right, so it's 43 feet ideally. The only difference, like my raised bed is a little bit higher than your raised bed. And yep. It was nice. I had the taught my daughter how to run the sawmill and she made this whole raised bed and so that was oh that's beautiful that's yeah, good yeah. thing for that and and uh, it looks like maybe you got a little bit extra height or did you actually sink it sink it down a little bit no i got a little bit extra height and that was just yeah. because of the way the lay of the land worked and yeah yeah i don't have to dig down very far here before i hit just straight gravel and rocks yeah so yeah yeah but it's it's the same. It's a post and beam construction. The same thing I did. And what you insulated around four feet under the ground is what you did. Or I insul insulated horizontally okay. four feet out okay. all the way around the building. Nice. And it's R forty insulation. Those old freezer panels that yeah. I salvaged and put all the way around because um, frost goes in at a forty five degree angle. Yeah. Right. So at four feet and forty five degree angle, you're going to be like six feet down before yeah. the frost gets underneath your foundation, right. essentially, and it's got no power down there. You yeah. can't do anything, right? So that's why I did it that way. Right, yeah. right. The freezer panels buried down there, okay. they come out three feet to four feet. They were salvage panels, so some were four feet, some were three feet, yeah. but they go all the way along, and then I put a cedar mulch over top of it, and then now I've got the snow just sitting on there, yeah. so you know that I'm not losing heat out of the building because the snow is still sitting there. It's yeah. not melting the snow or anything. And, but it's preventing the frost from going down underneath the bottom of the building. Exactly. Are uh, you thinking about doing rainwater collection as well up there eventually? It's in the plans. Yeah. I haven't missed it these last year and a half because we haven't got rain. So yeah. Yeah. But it would be part of something that I want to tackle yet too. Just yeah. yeah, me too. I just haven't got around to it yet. That rain water soft and good for plants, right? So. Yes. So. And I can't dig down. If I, I dig down here three feet right now with a shovel and you're pretty hard pressed to dig through it's a straight gravel it's pit underneath yep. there yep. so 
Well, that that could be a good heat sink if you ever lose any heat or the earth's pulling it. Maybe it's heating up all that rocks over the years. You yeah, never know. Maybe. So. We'll, we'll see if that yeah. matters. But at the moment, we only really have to worry about the heat with the way the building's designed internally just for those few weeks of the year where we're only getting six hours of sunlight. Yeah. Right? That's the critical part. And Now, this was a very mild winter, which worked yeah. to our benefit. But we had two weeks straight of minus 25 to minus 30, and then the other week where it was minus 41. And that, that's trying on everybody, but yeah. it worked really good. It was yeah, a fantastic sure. place to be and hang out by the banana trees. And yeah. So so at nighttime, you're keeping it kind of above 10 Celsius, kind of like I do? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, or? I don't want to go below 12 degrees, or okay. 10 is my minimum. Yeah. But like for the orange trees and the grapefruits and all that, they don't want to go less than that but that's why we couldn't use the geothermal heating of the air because six degrees is not enough to keep a plant going like yeah. the oranges and the grapefruits and the bananas they're all going to go into yeah hibernation kind of thing so and then the, the mangoes and everything else they need the warmer temperatures yeah, so yeah. for sure yeah so to use those uh evacuated tur tube solar heaters to charge up the the concrete and that sand and then insulate it so the earth doesn't suck it out right. has been so beneficial that just when we hit minus 40 and no sun that a little bit of diesel for extra heat for the entire winter and year year set so like the, the front window is a very large surface it is. of losing heat we're not as insulated as a wall for instance right yeah. if, if i had it just as a building i would never have to heat the place but because you're losing heat through windows and stuff there's not enough r value yeah. right then that heat migrating out of the sand battery during the night rising up to the fans and blowing around the front and the whole greenhouse just stays yeah. perfect exactly. all the time if it goes down to 12 degrees it's refreshing and then like the having the fish tank being black and when the sun hits that it'll raise up from say 14 degree water temperature in the morning to 17 or 18 degrees by afternoon and that will give off that BTUs it's a thousand gallons of energy stored off and release that into the room during the night and yeah the same thing with the the IBC totes that I have on the racking yeah they're all painted black and I've watched and they go from 12 degrees in the morning up to 17 degrees in the afternoon once the sun's hit them for that's five degrees of energy times a thousand liters times right now i only have six of them in place but they're giving off that heat and it's all thermal mass that's anything exactly. you can build in it, it works in your yeah. favor right so. oh yeah the more the better the the rock the sand the the concrete the water yeah. anything that's in here is thermal mass that'll radiate at night so um so your I still have an automated venting, but same thing. Somebody's somebody's got to be here to maintain it and open doors or windows type of thing. And I have a, a larger farm that keeps me here all the time anyway, yeah. busy. So this is a nice place just to come and run out and yeah, I got to go check yeah. the greenhouse and exactly. take a break from the rest of the things. And yeah. I better open a window and just walk all over, see yeah. the fish, make sure they're doing well and do the things. I would exactly. rather keep it simple, stupid, yeah. than to really. And to try to make automated openers to open windows in the winter time, with the humidity and the cold, the windows are frozen up and it's not working anyway. So, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. You did some uh, double pane windows. I reused those. Bus windows aren't as efficient and things. But even you were saying on the pony wall in the in the summertime because it's not that long this way. You and I were talking before, but we don't need that a lot to open uh, enough ventilation almost from the sides right yeah my prevailing wind is coming from the west right and it's the windows will be open on the west and open on the east and then i'll get that flow yeah. coming through cooler air is going to go down and then cycle through the greenhouse and as it gets out the far end because this greenhouse is always doing that circle of air right yeah. the hot air is rising getting blown down and going cool back up yeah. so as this cold air comes in here it does that spiral effect through the greenhouse and out the other end and cools it down on the way through. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you have the shade on the back in the summer months, right? Yeah. It's, it's really good. Uh, now the plants do lean a little bit towards the light, but that's you can't get changed. If that's an acceptable thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I did. I, I need the overhead door to get totes in, and sometimes I bring full totes of firewood in and that sort of thing. And the birdhouse gives me that opportunity to bring bigger things in. But to buy an R40 or R30 door is extremely expensive. So then I use two inch polystyrene panels, put it up there for when I'm not using the door, then I could get that extra layer of 
insulation on there and go back to being a super insulated wall so kind of. i notice everything super healthy in here like as my as is my greenhouse you did uh now a drip irrigation and cut back on the watering because me and you both have humidity issues um so the one thing i i learned like that climate battery doesn't i don't think works anywhere close to where as good as they do but everybody references that that uh oranges in the snow uh fellow in nebraska and but it's the soil's a lot warmer in nebraska and he did i think it's 80 foot or i can't remember but he brings in air underground fresh air into the greenhouse and then exhaust greenhouse so it's the there's more benefits in air exchange so if right, yes. so if uh if I that would be one recommendation me and you both didn't do would be to make a kind of a air exchanger not a climate battery that preheater on the air to get it coming in so you get right. fresher air coming in here because it's really difficult if it's minus 30 or 35 yeah. outside to get fresh air in here because you've yeah. just killed the plant two feet over right right yeah. so we that's why we don't open windows in the winter time yeah. very much exactly but yeah, uh, by drastically, I, I learned this, by drastically reducing watering in the main bed, I was way over watering and you mentioned you were too, that, that really took down the humidity because it's, it's a funny thing when the, the sun shines, it's, it seems to suck out the, the ground humidity like real, right now really fast and it gets super hot, super humid. Mm -hmm. So by reducing the winter watering, um, that solved that issues and i think for me that solved a lot of my pest issues by getting that humidity problem fixed but uh but you you've had the same thing uh, the odd white fly and fruit fly and you've tried beneficial insects and things and parasitical wasps seem to be a good one yeah um mealy bugs on the bananas we just have to a few things but everything's super healthy you're doing great in here so uh, it is lush and beautiful and like well last winter we were hand watering everything and we found we were under watering by the time we put when we put the drip irrigation yes. in it was a game changer but then yeah. we kind of got ahead of it after that yeah. and then we got too wet later on yeah. right yeah. but when the first winter my daughter was taking care of the greenhouse and but she's in school as well and she's doing half the milkings on the farm yeah. and notice that, so it's busy so then sometimes it's every other night she can make it in here and then yeah. some yeah. plants get missed or because it's almost dark when you're coming in and then we were underwater but then all of a sudden with the drip irrigation all of a sudden that's off the radar and you yeah. don't have to think about it anymore and yeah no, that was us too I, we had blossom end rot on our tomatoes because it just weird watering you let it dry out too much and stuff and then the drip irrigation on timers fixed that issue for sure but uh and i did increase yeah. for my tomatoes put more fans in to get it more airflow to help them pollinate better yeah Right, because I don't have any bees coming in here in the winter time. I tried honey bees in the greenhouse in the winter time. That was a disaster. So okay, yeah, yeah. Actually, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that, you did try honey bees because that had crossed my mind. But uh, after what our private conversation, maybe mason bees might be the answer. But you briefly touch on that. Yeah. Well, I would prefer bumblebees cause, or mason bees because they're so efficient at pollinating. Right. Better than a honey bee. Yeah. Honey bees going after nectar, not pollen, right. most of the time, depending on the time of the year. But the bees when it got like plus 30 in here all of a sudden were wanting to go outside and they'd go flying out and hit the corner window or wherever yeah. they were going for summer cooler or whatever but those, that window is still sitting at minus 25 or yeah. whatever yeah. and they hit there they hit the condensation on it and they all fall to the ground and there's a big pile of <laughs> slowly moving bees sitting there in yeah. the cold ground and then you pick them up try to put them back in their home and it doesn't really work yeah, yeah. well it's good that you tried it and i didn't have to so yeah. i learned from you now yeah <laughs> perfect yeah, whole, yeah. it was a huge robust colony of bees yeah. they, uh, whole frames full and then by the end of winter i ended up with a little tiny handful yeah. I mean, they're still alive outside we made it through but they stayed outside this winter yeah yeah if you don't try anything you don't learn but so, th so this is, did you say a thousand gallon uh, fish tank and rainbow trout in there? Yes, that's what it is. I actually got a, just a big water tank. It was 1,250 gallon tank because it, it was a lot cheaper and just cut the whole top of it off. Oh, nice. Put yeah. that away and that's my tank. Yeah. It's a resilient tank. I've seen other ones with the liners in them and then working with students and stuff. Then all of a sudden a disaster happens where yeah. this is, I tried to make it resilient to work. So trout doing so good that you had to put a little lip because they're jumping out on you and stuff like that but yeah, yeah and you have to do something pretty quick when they yeah and 
yeah, the measurements aren't there. I just watched enough YouTube videos to figure out how a good system. It was a good. It's a good system. How it worked, and then I built it, and then all of a sudden you go, "Ooh, I should have maybe dropped that pipe so the water level was yeah. six inches lower, and then I wouldn't have had that problem." But I went away one time, and I just got 50 new fish, and I no one gave me 120. He gave me an extra 20 for my dad anyway, because he eats a fish every week out of yeah. here. And then next morning I came. I was going to Montreal, and he was going to take care of the fish. By the end of the first day, there was 20 of them laying on the side here, so he quickly got a Cut a sheet of plywood yeah. up and screwed it on here. You didn't lose any more fish since then. So that way, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, nice. And rainbow trout's a colder water fish, but how how is it doing in the greenhouse for temperature wise? So far, I monitor when it starts to get too hot, coming like springtime. Yeah. I will just turn off the solar thermal heating, and then it, the fish tank won't get heated anymore. It's just in contact with the concrete. That's what's making its temperature rise up right. more. Okay. And then the sun shining. Well, now the sun's not even hitting it anymore. Yeah. But it's about 22 degrees. Rainbow trout max is 25. Yeah. So, but I like to keep it between 15 and 20 or whatever. Okay. But, but so far, fish haven't suffered for heat yet. Yeah. But I gotta monitor it a little bit just with the heating system. But when yeah. this is starting to get too hot, the whole greenhouse doesn't need to be heated yeah. by out solar anymore. Perfect symbiotic relationship between the the fish and the plants. The plants. A fish, when it breathes out, it breathes out ammonia out of its gills. And then in the ground outside, like when we farm fields, there's natural occurring bacteria that convert ammonia into nitrite and then into nitrate. And that's all we've got growing over time on these pebbles, clay beds. That So when the fish breathes out is ammonia, like if your aquarium gets too high of levels, you got to change out half the water. Well, in this case, the water flows through the bed, and in the hour that it takes to fill this bed, the bacteria convert the ammonia into nitrite, and then into nitrate. The plant's roots take up the nitrates in that amount of time, and then the water drains back out and gets pumped back towards the fish. It gets aerated on the way, and then it just keeps that cycle going the whole time. Yeah. The plants grow from the fish, the fish get clean water from the plants, and the only input is I've got a one-third horsepower septic pump pumping the water back, Yep. And then it goes through two venturis that bring in air to vent the thing. And then the other, that's the only energy input really into the system. Yep. And then the fish food. Right. 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 And fish are very good converters of food yep. to, to pounds per game. So, yeah. And they taste fantastic, actually. I was surprised. I told other people that they wouldn't but because they said, oh, it's too warm a water or this or that. But I think it's the water quality is one of the issues. I'm not 100% certain, but they were... <coughs> bright pink looked like salmon out of the ocean kind yeah. of thing when I filled them all and uh, yeah they were after a year there was some between three and four pounds nice. the yeah. nice big two foot long fish perfect yeah yeah I would love to have caught them on a mountain stream because it would yeah. have been a fight <laughs> yeah nice. oh that's that's great I think uh I think you convinced me to go to a larger tank and a circular tank the way you kind of did some of the pump system um, sorry, what was the, so you don't need air, electric air bubbler, what is that thing called again? It that goes through a venturi, and the way a venturi concept works is that, say you've got a half inch line of water coming in, and then you decrease it down to a quarter inch, and then when it opens back up, that's a negative pressure part, and it's a natural vacuum yeah. occurs right there. So it is going to pull in air from an airline into that one point and diffuse it out into the water, so you get to your natural effect and you don't have to have an air stone now i'm gonna put an air stone in as a backup so if the pump ever fails then i'll just have a tank of compressed air that automatically a little solenoid bulb will open yeah. and trickle air out for the next two or three hours at least i have the resiliency that my fish are going to make through the night if it goes off at 10 o'clock at night when i'm in bed or something perfect yeah so from a third horsepower uh, pump you operate this whole system that is about 30 feet long ish almost of uh growing space and then that a thousand gallon tank with a whole lot of fish and you also plumbed it a certain way it's kind of got a vortex system or current in yes. there as well yeah so, so great then, system yeah. yeah the water gets swirled in motion and the fish always want to swim against the current yeah. right and then as it swirls and the fish stir things up the water flows out and takes the actual waste out and then i've got just a settling filter built in that that waste like the actual uneaten fish food and the fish poop and that kind of thing 
just gets fed to the banana trees. But you don't want that going into your grow beds because it'll gum them all up and they'll be disgusting unless you put red wiggler worms in there or something. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. No, you convinced me, so I'm going to pick myself up a tank and you can help me, uh, instruct me how to set it up. So yep. this, this is great. The lettuce growing here and that's just the, everything runs by gravity from the fish tank all the way through. It's all done by gravity and then it drains through a bell siphon, a bell siphon yeah. right back into the, into the sump tank. Yep. And then from there back to the fish tank. So then even the lettuce here on the end, that was just the extra water that didn't drain into the grow beds. It's going in through there and the lettuce are just growing straight out of the out of the water from the fish. Right. right? And okay. there's enough bacteria already readily available in all of the water that these ones don't have to be in the stones, right? They're just yeah. growing. They already have that ability to pull out the nitrogen or the uh, nitrites. Nitrates. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Then just a little bit of supplemental light at the back because again we're barely we're only getting full sun in uh, like the dead of the winter and then it's shaded so that LED lights are very efficient but a little bit of lights for that and yeah that's a little bit of power for me and a little bit of fans back here too to move it so I didn't get quite as leggy of plants yeah There's a little little resistance on them helps a little bit more so what do you got in here. Well, I think, I don't even know anymore because they're reproducing fairly quickly, but I've got, I think there's 10 budgies, several finches. Um, there was a canary too, or a couple canaries. I don't know, there's many different varieties of them. So I, I saw a video come out and the sound that songbirds make first thing in the morning before the sun's even rising affects the stomata of a plant to get ready to grow and meet its day. And it's this very common the frequency is the same as what's in classical music, right? And so that's why plants go better if you play music for them. So then I built this little birdhouse for my daughter for her birthday and let her get all the birds. And yeah, they quite love to just sit in here and watch the birds do their thing. But yeah, it's good for their mental health or whatever. It's just enjoyable to sit down and watch the birds play. And yeah. if you find chickweed in the greenhouse, feed it to these things. They love chickweed. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so... Yeah, I heard the, the same article, the frequency of the birds, and they wake up the plants in the morning with their song, and it's just like bringing nature inside in our minus 30 winters, right? And it, it brings joy to everybody else around, too. Like right? yeah. have birds to look at and sit here. You can sit here on a really cold day by the fire, getting the sunshine in here yet, looking at through banana trees and pretend you're in Costa Rica. you got the birds chirping, yeah. and you never had to leave home. My wife and daughter's got this banana tree at Home Depot, it's kind of in August, end of the season sale because it's getting closer enough to frost. I think they only paid 35 or 40 bucks for this banana tree and then put it in here. That was a year and a half ago, I guess. It's grown crazy. It's touching 14, 15 feet tall and the leaves are breaking because it can't push taller anymore. And then we also have a dwarf Cavendish over there that's a little bit older of a tree, but it's not near as tall. It's, yeah. We'll see which one races to give me fruit first. I'm beginning to think I'm doing something wrong because no, you have three coming. you have three different clumps of bananas I'm still sitting on none you're kind of <laughs> selfish that way <laughs> I'm just lucky yeah, yeah. And well we do have a, a year difference in starting point of our oh, greenhouse yes, right? Yeah, right so there is that too I hope I don't have to wait another year but yeah, yeah. It's, it's coming this this summer at the latest you'll have yeah. this one, yeah. so and then but yeah, what else you got? Just give me a little under here you know. we've kind of got our uh citrus bed more or less and then on the wall here i built a trellis for my grapes they're starting to just i don't know if you call them blossoms or flowers or whatever but there's little grape pods starting there as soon as the days started to get a little bit longer they decided it was springtime and it was time to just grow yep. so it, it's starting to take off that way then up front over here got our strawberry bed i did have to add a little bit of light up here to get decent production through the winter time but it's working much better now we ate fresh strawberries last night so yep, it's good they got yeah. blueberries are starting to bloom and uh, my wife and daughters really like a lot of flowers so they will be starting cuttings and stuff for our outside flowers this year right quick here and we've got a lot of them growing it's been all winter long some of these just overwinter them in here and they just keep on flowering away and the zucchinis are just planted and busy starting to bloom out that's 
little bit of tobacco that refuses to stop growing. It just every time I cut it down and harvest it, they come more come back volunteer themselves to be tobacco. So, and we've got our catnip and lemon balm, and tomatoes, asparagus shouldn't have been planted in here really, but we had to rescue it from the rabbits because they were eating it off as fast as it would grow. So. The rose was a little bit late for Valentine's Day, but it still looks pretty today. So. And then we've got three peaches there that my sister found them growing in her compost pile. And then they're just taking off right now. So hopefully, maybe next year, maybe this year, we'll get them a few peaches. We'll see. And then, yeah, the beans are all busy flowering. It's, it's one thing to have canned beans and stuff like that, but it's a completely different thing just to eat them fresh out of the garden every day if you want to. So, all right, you got nice, clean rows. It looks so nice, you guys. Yeah. Uh, with the drip irrigation, it does help. You want to plant it in that row to get close to the drip, right? right. So, right. yeah, I would want to get, like, I shouldn't have this rose bush here because it's blocking sun from things behind right we want to plant in a row so the sun's going to make it all the way down to the as deep into the back as i can get i don't want to block it off with something up front so that's why we orientated everything that direction and uh, uh, electroculture uh, certain thing planting north to south is also beneficial right so that's kind of how i always plant my garden garden north to south and i don't know if i always notice a difference between a few rows that get planted east to west but we try it anyway get all the odds in your favor so and then to try to keep the tomatoes growing vertically all in a row they're doing really well but I'm just trying to learn as I go along and every year try to do a little bit better than the time we did before and uh, yeah it's getting a little crazy the bok choy is getting out of control and the spinach I plant these ones up here they're more of a cold liking plant yeah. for the winter months they'll do a lot better up here like yeah, close to the window, yeah. and the kale over here i can keep harvesting it it's in my coldest window of the whole place yeah. but some of those kales are a year and a half old they just keep producing and producing you just keep plucking off ones you want to eat and keep going and the celery same type of deal just keep harvesting it And it, it's so nice to come out and cook some chicken for supper, go out and pick up some thyme. Cook them some lamb for supper, go out and get some rosemary. Just send them to the grocery store out in the back yard yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, that's nice. All winter long, you're eating kind of fresh. So. Exactly, yeah. Last year, because I couldn't get these salvaged freezer panels to butt up really nice, I put a lot of insulation in between, but then this year to keep the frost farther back I do have two feet of polystyrene going out vertical underneath it here yet too and then the walls are buried down into the ground to the four foot level but then I built the raised bed just to give me that other layer of sealant I essentially and then when the water comes off here in the summertime we can grow all the flowers that they want and they can get them out of the greenhouse and grow real food in the greenhouse and have it look pretty up front and beehives here in the garden just three of them I might almost see if I how many more I get this year but close to the green yeah I wanted to be in control of that because I had bee farmers have bees on my own property but when I have my my peaches and pear not peaches but the pear trees and the apple trees and the plums all blooming and then the guys come and bring their bees out a week afterwards and I was like ah I could have used some pollination last week yeah. but now I have my own and then if the girls plant flowers here up front that brings those bees closer in and then they're just going to migrate into the greenhouse and do their job in there too and I don't have to worry about pollinating zucchinis and stuff like that. So, uh, You should briefly convince me on the solar thermal evacuated tubes. I know that they're pricey. I got a deal on um, uh, uh, PV panels, photovoltaic, so I'm thinking about using uh, electricity direct to heat water takes up a lot more sun surface area like four panels like that you put on the greenhouse it, it doesn't take up a lot of space but you said this winter because we got to minus 40 celsius that's when he used hundred dollars worth of diesel the whole winter right so 
there there'll be people, maybe politicians I've heard saying uh, greenhouses are bad for the environment. It takes a lot of heating and stuff. So you proved them wrong even better than I did because my total operational cost is maybe $600 this winter okay. because you have that 100 bucks like for the whole winter. Yeah, right? that's I bring a jerry can of diesel over and pour it in and that's yeah. what it is. That. But each one of those panels will put out 16,000 BTUs. Okay. So then you can do the math on what your heat exchange would do on your photovoltaic heating okay. to see how equivalents they are for price per BTU putting out. Right? Yes. Yeah. So th and then this will store it. And I don't there's calculations you can figure out how much sand will store of BTUs. Yes. Yeah. But I don't know what that is. I don't do that math. I yeah. just know that I this is what worked for me and right. I did it. Right? Well, act actually, that's funny because I think with photo um, photovoltaics, one watt is equal to like three point something BTUs is the rough estimate. So 16,000 BTUs times four is 64,000 BTUs. And I got 24,000 watts of panels times three. It's about the same. But but you just have four racks versus I have to build a rack that's like 80 feet by 14 feet. So, so it takes up a lot of real estate. It is real estate. And I think the photovoltaic uh, option, just because of the deal I got, is quite a bit cheaper than those. But right. I'm either either works. But uh, I got these from Simple Solar in Calgary. Okay. And I, I saw it on Verge Permaculture, and, it was, and it's a very resilient, good system. Like okay. I love it to death, and they were really good to work with. Yeah. Right. But they have the photovoltaic panels on top of them so that they run DC pumps oh, yeah. so yeah. that everything runs no matter as soon as the sun hits those photovoltaic panels the heat pump turns on yeah. and runs water through so you never if the power were to go out and then you're counting on your regular grid power to run your pumps yeah. all of a sudden you're blowing your thermostat and everything else because you yeah. don't have movement but I always do have movement and it works right. fantastic that way and uh, and also with the solar thermal evacuated tubes, they're supposed to be, the claim is that they're 80% efficient on the sun's energy that comes past them. They right. observe and convert that into heat yeah. versus photovoltaics, they say are 20% efficient of what energy comes to them yeah. that they convert into electricity. Yeah, right. and, and that's that's essentially converts to the sun surface area I need, but... So you might have convinced convinced me on those, even though it might cost a little bit more than the. Maybe I'll use my photovoltaics for electricity. Maybe I'll switch to this because it works so good for you, man. And I, I set them up at an angle that's exactly the right angle for the sun on December twenty first. Okay. So yeah. that I'm going to get it dead on at that time because that's when I need the most heat because yeah. I'm not getting very many hours. We're getting maximum six hours of usable sunlight yep. if there's no clouds in the sky kind yep. of thing on that day and that's when it's crucial yeah for right? sure so and when you build the outdoor pool right here in the summertime you can heat the pool with that because <laughs> in, in the summer they, they've got a dissipation heat dissipation loop on the back side of it right so in the summertime when i don't need that heat it's just dissipating back out it's absorbing and yep. dissipating into the atmosphere but if i can find somewhere i need heat in the summertime then you got it so if the swimming pool becomes an option, yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. So the, the solar thermal has a DC pump, so that if your power goes out, it's still going to run the pump to move. Yes. Yeah, so it's two like little. This would be your inlet line. There's a mixing valve, so in the morning you'll get too cold of water flowing through it first. So that will just go back up again, so you're not putting that into your heat exchanger until it gets warm enough, and then it'll take the heat. It'll come down in. But you got one DC pump here, and then another DC pump here. They're just working in tandem together. And then you're, right now we're getting 1.6 gallons per minute, or five liters per minute flow off these two DC pumps okay. running through here. And yeah, it's just a very resilient system. Yeah. That part's all with glycol, and then the rest after that it goes to a heat exchanger, right. and then heats the floor or beneath the floor with water yeah i was initially thinking i would do a rocket mass heater in here and then i might need the heat protection but wood stoves are built so efficiently that they don't put out heat behind but now i have the blaze king uh 40 i guess it would be the, the king variety i can put 100 pounds of wood in there and it'll burn for a full blast for five or six hours straight and it does wonderful i love that thing so. 
Uh, well, this is fantastic, Patrick. Thanks for showing this to me and inviting me out and for your hospitality. I am happy to see more of these being built. And you and I off camera, of course, were talking that um, I decided to share what I'm doing and you're gracious enough to, sh to show this to people as well. And we would like more people to kind of consider these concepts, build them yourselves if you have farms and homesteads. Resilience, we don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. We don't want to be the only people doing this because it does work and it works very well. I don't know, would you kind of agree with that's what we were talking about? Yeah, yeah. I, I like to be in control of uh, personal food security for me, yeah. right? And this is almost bigger than what a family needs more. Yeah. Like I can, I have a big farm and uh, my parents live close by. They come here, my dad fishes once a week. He takes out a fish and goes home with it. And that's yeah. wonderful. And then my mother is an expert gardener, but she can come in here and teach my daughter how to propagate other plants and do things like that and it's great that whole community family living and how it was meant to be and I, I don't like everything I see in our food system so the more things I can control myself the better off we will be yeah. and more people can do that too we need personal food security we need community food security getting this on a community level like we work with schools to help kids with that sort of thing too but yeah. Yeah. it has to be done a lot more yeah, for sure no, uh, totally agree. It's and and being able to do that in our zone. Are you zone three or four, Guardian? Same as you. Same as me. So zone three, same climate as as I am. Um, to be able to grow bananas, and you, they are going to fruit for you shortly here, and it's going to be amazing. And their bananas are the easiest thing thing to grow. Would you agree? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, they are reproducing like crazy. Yeah. You're putting out yeah. a lot of pops and stuff, so. Yeah, it's not hard. Once you do the building and infrastructure and build it, it's everything's very easy. And with you doing that solar thermal and putting it to the concrete and that sand battery system and you reducing almost, if we if if we had sun on those minus 40 Celsius days, I bet you wouldn't need that $100 diesel for the winter. But the winter, the close. night was still pretty long. Right? Yes. You're still yeah. sitting with 4 o'clock at night, the sun kind of going yeah. down, and then you're sitting until... Nine o'clock the next morning before you have sun yeah. again, and it's a yeah. long night to go through. So, cost I'm willing to bear. Yeah, yeah. To have what we have inside yeah. here. A hundred bucks. Oh no, what's yeah. that? Uh, uh, like a bag you can lift with your pinky at the grocery store. Yeah, that's right now, that's what <laughs> just keeps giving yeah. back. So yeah. And the only thing I was gonna say between your zone and my zone is I get Chinooks and you don't. So you don't necessarily need it the way the greenhouse is designed, but it does make life easier to bear when you can yes. go from, it's not minus 41 for three weeks straight, yeah. it'll be for one week or less, and then we're gonna go up to minus yeah. 15. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, I built it like where our latitude is 53, is, does that sound right? Yeah, 50, yeah 50, 55. Yours is the same, but, but you're closer to the Rocky Mountains, so you get the blasts of warm air occasionally type of thing, so. So yeah, it's working in um, central Alberta, same latitude as central Saskatchewan where I am, and uh, it, it just works. So su super insulation, thermal mass, and the proper design, knowing where the sun is, and that's that's about it. I mean, yeah, it's, well, you put the concepts out there, and when I looked at it, I said, yes, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. and, it, and it works. And so we tried it, and it's worked. It's, uh, yep. Well... Again, Patrick, thanks for show, showing this to me, and thanks for also being willing to put it out there. I really appreciate it, and thanks for your hospitality. It's been great to come for a visit, and uh, yeah, thank you. It was really nice to show it yeah. back to you, too. So. Absolutely. Now you're YouTube famous. Patrick doesn't have a YouTube channel, but I'm going to convince him, maybe. No, yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.